I'm Patrick Medebi, your host of Valuetainment, and today we have a very special guest with us. The author of the infamous book, 48 Laws of Power, Robert Greene. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my pleasure, Patrick. Thank you for having Absolutely. me. It took a while, but I'm glad I'm finally here. It took us, what, 12 years since, <laughs> since the first time? <laughs> Not, that long. Not that long. We had, we had a good time at Rafi's place. Yes, very and, much so. Uh, and uh, it was a good conversation. That was probably pre-interview, you know, the stuff we talked about. Uh -huh. Hopefully, we're going to change the world together, you, you and know, I. Somebody should have recorded it. Somebody this. should have recorded on what we talked about. But, yeah. you know, it's interesting. It was um, 2003. Mm -hmm. Robert, I had a friend comes up to me, and he, his name is Ben, and he says, Patrick, there is this book you got to read, but it's a secret. You can't tell everybody because it's a very powerful book. But if I tell you about it, you can't recommend it to anybody else. I said, what's the name of this book? He sneaks away, goes to the back of his car, says, the book is called 48 Laws of Power, but I mm -hmm. promise me you're not going to recommend it to anybody. Well, he's recommending it to you. <laughs> he's recommending it to me. Yeah. And I started reading and I said, what an incredible book, you know, with uh, 40 Laws of Power. And then from there, you know, obviously 33 Strategies of War, Art of Seduction, Mastery, 50th Law. Um, last year, our book club, we read your mastery. It was about a thousand people that read the book together. Phenomenal mm -hmm. book. But let's get right into it. So here's what I like to do. I like to first, uh, 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 you know, get to know who Robert Greene was before, how the inspiration got started. There's some general questions I was asked through social media. And then I have some specific questions for you from the book, and then, and then we'll go from there. So Robert Greene, who was Robert Greene in high school? Poop. Um, I was a bit of a lost kid, um, had long hair, you know, um, and I was a bit of a weirdo, uh, didn't fit in. You know, I went to a kind of a surfer school, Palisades High, a lot of blonde kids surf, not a very intellectual environment. And I loved books and reading. Um, and my even head, then? Even then. My head was in the clouds. Um, so I just didn't fit in. Um, but I had, you know, some good friends. I had pretty close family. Um, and and I, to be honest with you, I got into drugs, uh, which continued on in college. So a little bit of the high school sort of a, a cloud. I, I got straight A's, never got a be my whole life. And now, did the drugs school. help you get straight A's? Or <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I did it. I don't know how I did it, particularly in college. Um, but I think um, knowing uh, that I had a love of knowledge mm -hmm. uh, kept me alive, kept me straight. You know, um, I just wanted to read about everything. I don't know what, if I understood what I was reading, but I just love reading about history, about war, about Even sports. Even then you like reading about history. I know. My, my, I tell my, my mom remembers this story when I was 13, 12 maybe. Um, I had a list of books that I wanted to order from this sort of this company that shipped books out for young readers. And I had uh, like 20 books that I ticked off. Half of them were about wars and battles. I just was, <laughs> uh, I love reading about warfare when I was a kid. So I was a bit of a lost kid. I don't know if uh, if you saw a photograph of me back then, you wouldn't really recognize me. Can we actually find it online? <laughs> yeah, like, my wife has a, has a picture in her office of me with long hair. And whenever people come over, she says, look, this is what Robert looked like. And they all go, whoa. Now, let me ask you, was, was it? I look like it? Peter Frampton. I'm really curious to see it because you look <laughs> like a Hollywood actor. So I'd be curious to know what you looked at in high school. But, but let me ask you, was there like, was it? Your father, your mother, was it an uncle? Was it somebody that inspired you to want to read his? Or was it just in you, period? It's something I talk about in Mastery. Mm -hmm. um, I have a chapter, the most important chapter in the book is about your life's task. Discovering what it is that you were meant to do in life. Uh, which I think is the most important thing for anybody in anybody's life. And I go in the book, I recount all of these famous people, uh, and the moment when they were three, four, or five years old and they discovered what it is that they loved, like Einstein with the compass, mm -hmm. or Steve Jobs passing by an electronic store. And the point in the book is there's no real rational explanation why people are attracted to something. I can't give you a rational reason why I was drawn to books or literature. My father isn't like that. He was a businessman. He was sold chemical supplies. My mother was a housewife. Um, you know, they loved learning, but neither of them were readers or intellectuals or anything. I can't explain it to you. There's no rational reason. 
It's just something, I was drawn to it. There was something within me that was just drawn to history. I know it was like history. I just am fascinated by anything in any culture, any period, and, uh, and literature. So I, there's, no, there's nothing I, I can't say why. So, so, so with that, because you talk about this also in Mastery, I'm, I'm curious if you can maybe uh, allude to it a little bit more, is do you think certain people who are, you know, end up doing something incredibly great, you know, like I'm talking about something that's out of the ordinary. I mean, you didn't write a book that sold 50,000 copies. It sold millions of copies worldwide. All of them are international best bestsellers. Do you think somebody who does incredibly great things in their lives, is it something they're born with? Or is it events that affects them? Is it an influence? Is it an inspiration? You know how you say leaders are born or leaders are built? What's your opinion about that? Well, like anything in life, it's a combination of things. There's no simple little formula. So first of all, genetics definitely play a role. And I talk about it in Mastery. So why am I attracted to books? Why is Tiger Woods drawn at the age of 12 months or 14 months attracted to golf, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's a genetic reason for that. There's something about the way your brain is wired. There's a great book, I think it's Howard Gardner, called The Five Frames of Mind, I believe, I don't know if I'm quoting it correctly. There are five forms of human intelligence, the kinetic, the mathematical, the et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Each person tends to have a dominant form of intelligence that they're that they are good at. Why? It's genetic. Um, you're born that way, and it's not necessarily anything that comes from your parents. It could come from way back in your in your past. That's an important component, and the, the key in life is being aware of what makes you different, of what you're naturally drawn to, of these what I call these. Um, uh, well, I forget my word in the uh, in the book. Um, these inclinations, these primal inclinations. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, experience is equally important. Uh, your teachers, your parents, the environment that you live in, uh, the people that you <clears throat> know as you're growing up, um, have a huge impact on you. You throw all of that together, and that sort of makes who you are. Um, if I hadn't met Yost Elfers when I was 35 years old, the man who ended up packaging the 48 Laws of Power, I could have all the knowledge and brilliance or wisdom about power, mm -hmm. but I would have never written the book because I met him, so luck enters. You had no plans of writing a book at all? Not really, no. So luck enters wow. into the picture. You know, if there's, there's an a element of luck. You don't choose your parents. You don't choose that you were born in Iran. All these other things come together. And, you know, so obviously initiative and effort and something inside of you and willpower is the most important thing. Your level of persistence, not anything intellectual. Um, but then there's an the element of luck and blind chance and genetics that come in and play an important role. Yeah. So, so the part about the desire, the willpower, can a generation be also affected by that, by a standard of a government or what's being taught or the media? Can all of that also have an effect on that? The firepower in the belly? Yes, most definitely. Um, you know, America in the 19th century, when you were growing up, uh, uh, you, you, the, the myth of Yankee ingenuity, uh, the whole work ethic, uh, it was a communal thing. Mm. Um, people believed that through hard work, that's what made you come uh, to America. Um, and, you know, young people were raised with that. I do believe, though, that some people are born with a higher level of ambition than other people. You think the ambition yeah. is really? Yeah. Um, there's statistics that show in a group of a hundred people, five will be leaders. They show, there's a studies that show the 5% rule, that essentially it's 5% mm -hmm. of people that are naturally born leaders. It doesn't mean the 95% are all just followers. There's other places, other roles for people. But there are people that have more ambition, more drive, more hunger. Some of that is comes from just something genetic and some of it comes from the culture, definitely. Do you, do you think when you said, you know, in America, how it was where you came here, immigrants came, if you work hard, you can have the life that you want to have and you can have everything if you're a hardworking person. Do you think that maybe the millennial or the Gen Y subscribes to that philosophy as well today? No, they don't. 
no. Um, I think a lot of that is lost. I mean, I, I, for my new book and for all of my books, I read a lot of history. And if you look at any great culture or empire, mm -hmm. there is inevitably a period of decline. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I perhaps a student of ancient Rome. Rome started declining at a point more or less actually before Julius Caesar. Too much money, too much success. A generation is born living in luxury. They're expecting to have everything sort of given to them. And in a period of a hundred years, Rome just basically falls apart. You can look at that in the Spanish Empire. You can see about England. It's probably happening to America as well. It's a sort of a cycle. And young people today, they don't grow up with the same kind of hunger and drive that I know my father whose family were immigrants, uh, second generation immigrants that they had. Uh, but when I go to a country like in my travels to Russia or India, I see people there who are really, really hungry for a middle class, upper middle class lifestyle. And they are extremely driven to go to school and to learn and, and better themselves. So I think America is, um, there, there's some problems up ahead. And a lot of it is why I wrote Mastery. I wanted to show you, here's a blueprint. This is a formula. It's not rock, it's not magic, it's real. Since the beginning of time, since we human beings have been what we are, um, this is the sort of the path that people have followed to become absolutely spectacularly brilliant at their field. Mathematics, sports, whatever it is, it's a path. Here it is, because so many people nowadays believe it is just about luck or who, if you are able to go to Harvard, or if your parents can't afford to send you to a good school, then you're screwed, mm -hmm. or you have to be born a Michael Jordan. No, none of this is true. It's all about what you do with your own natural talent. Interesting. So going back to what you said with hunger, do you th what do you think is the cause where a generation maybe loses the hunger? Uh, like you said, the hunger is not the same. You said your father came here, immigrant, you know, working building something, the work ethic. What's caused this generation to lose the hunger? You know, if I had the answer to that, Patrick, I'd be a billionaire. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's complex. I don't like simplifying things. It's one of my pet peeves. I don't like simple pet answers to stuff. Um, and, you know, some of it is, to me, comes from one very fundamental belief. Do you believe that through your own effort, through education, through consciousness, through thinking, through reflecting, you can improve yourself. Do you fundamentally, deep down in Syria, right in the center of your gut, do you believe that? Because some people will say, yeah, I do, but they don't really believe it. They think inside that it's luck, it's circumstances, it's, you know, who, who, what school you went to, etc. And there, uh, whether you can, you know, maybe there's a drug that'll make me feel good so I don't get depressed. People who believe in crutches, they don't think that it comes from somewhere inside. I think you can make a division there and there. Do you really in your gut believe that through your own efforts, no matter what happens to you, you can, through learning, etc., improve yourself? And we've lost that. A lot of people have lost that deep, deep sense of connection to it. Not in a verbal way, like I'm telling you, mm -hmm. but you feel it. So, so that part here in, in the book in 48 Laws, you talk about what made Alexander special is one, uh, two people. One of them was his mother and one of them was Aristotle, right? Where his mother had this unwavering belief in the fact that this guy's going to do something special with his life, right? And then he has Aristotle that taught him how to control your emotions, how to stay stable, how to make better decisions, rhetoric, all that stuff that he's teaching. Do you think for me to have that hunger that you're saying it's lost, you got to have that deep down hunger in your belly and your fire, do you think somebody needs to sell that to me? Do you think somebody needs to impose that belief in me from the top, maybe it's the country that from the, hey, we're the greatest country in the world in the United States of America, you can do whatever you want to do, you can go out there. Do you think that message of selling is the reason why the generation of Americans that were so optimistic that anything was possible and maybe we're not selling that concept no more? Or do you think it's just a one-man show where the millennials are not really that driven anymore? I know, I'm giving you the question. I know, I know, I know. Well, um, this is a lot easier than the lunch questions uh, you and I have. Yeah, man. Um, well, you know, you can't sell it. It's like a culture that, that evolves. 
where people come to America in the 19th century, it's a hard life, it's a pioneer life, it's farming, it's making a living in a harsh environment. There are still uh, Native Americans there, out there to, to kill you, et cetera. Um, and you had to work like a devil to, to get anything that you wanted. So it's not like some salesman out there, a Dale Carnegie saying, look, here's the American, you, it was just natural. It came up through a- So you don't think and, Ray, Reagan and, sold, you don't think Kennedy sold us on how great we no, are? No, it did. It, those things matter. Those things are very important, but there has to be, it's like, let's say I'm a farmer, I want to plant seeds so trees grow. If I start throwing them into sand, nothing's gonna you gotta grow. Water. Well, it has to be a fertile soil. Yeah. And right now there's not a fertile soil. So I always talk about Kennedy. That to me was the last real president that did what I think a president should do. He created a myth, the myth of the new frontier. We Americans, we're gonna go back to our pioneer spirit. It's gonna be centered around the race towards the moon, technology, etc., And we're gonna be what our ancestors were, very powerful. And, it, and we're still living off the things that Kennedy was talking about. Uh, early on about the new frontier. Those things matter. And Reagan, what Reagan said, and Clinton, et cetera, these things are very important. But there has to be a culture there that's receptive. There has to be an ethos that comes from below, that's what you're born with, that your parents instill in you. If that's not there, no amount of selling is gonna do it. So from your parents, ethos from your parents, so parents doing the job, what Alexander's mother did to inject that belief in them could play and a better don't, role. And don't play Alexander's father, Philip of Macedonia. If there hadn't been a Philip of Macedonia, of course. his mother would have just been this insane of woman. Of course, <laughs> of course, uh, of course. You know, yeah. but, but there, was that, there was that part about your first law is never outshine your master. There yeah. was an element of oh, yeah. she wanted that as well. I mean, you know the whole story on how yeah. that worked out, but interesting. Yeah. So, so let me ask you this. Let me ask you, since we're all, we have completely digressed from general questions, we've gone right into it because, uh, you know. I'm all about digression. You, <laughs> you are, so we're going to get into it. But, uh, you know, here's a question for you. Okay, so what caused America to, to do very good? I mean, obviously, free market capitalism. We, uh, I lived in Iran, so Iran went from imperialism to dictatorship to what happened there with the revolution, and you saw... Uh, when uh, uh, Russia and some of these countries try to subscribe to communism with, you know, the, the inspiration of the book being Communist Manifesto, and America said, we're going to do free market capitalism. You come here, you work, you can build a good life for yourself. If you're willing to, you know, roll up your sleeves and get to work, you can have the opportunity to build in your American dream. So all these immigrants from all over the world, I got to go to America. I got to go to America, right? And we got 45 million in, um, immigrants in America. Number two is Russia with 11 million. Do you think the role... And again, this is not going to be a yes or no. I'm just curious what you say about this. The role of free market capitalism is two people play a very big role. One is the individual who maybe sells the dream, comes up with a concept, creates something. And then it's the you know, collective effort, right? So we can't go out there and just say, hey, you know, maybe during one era of a president, it's all about the individual. Let's you know, take care of the rich. And in another generation, it's only about collective. How do you think we balance those two out as a country where it's not leaning just towards one side or the other side? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, America's always been uh, an individualist culture, um, and that's its strength, and you have to play to your strengths. Um, we're not really ever been a, a collectivist mentality. Um, and you go You don't to, think so? No, absolutely never. You go to any other country in the world, and that's the first thing that they talk about. Sometimes you need an outsider to sort of tell you who you are. Everywhere you go, America is a country of individuals. It's an individual spirit, particularly in Europe, uh, when you contrast a country like Spain or Germany or England with the United States. It's what we're known for. Um, is that a bad thing or is no, it? Okay. No, it's a great thing. It's a great thing. Um, and, there, of course, every country uh, has, has great individuals and an individual sure. spirit, so these are generalizations. Um, but, um, in general, I believe that that sort of ethos of um, I'm going to um, sort of develop my natural genius, who I am, and I'm going to create something great, whether it's a business or, a, you know, books or architecture, mm -hmm. and in that way, I'm enriching the culture. That's the, to me, that's the American dream. 
you do something as an individual know that, knowing that you're enriching the society at large. In other countries, it's the opposite mentality. Everything is geared towards the social, and the individual doesn't matter as much. And so you don't really have that sense. Like if you're somebody with a lot of ambition and you want to create a great business, it's almost like you feel guilty. You feel ashamed. Mm -hmm. You feel dirty. Because your first thought is towards realizing your own ambition, and it is not towards uh, the collective dream. These are, these are generalizations. But I believe that that is the strength of America. Um, and you go to a, a country now like France, which is experiencing a, a lot of economic problems. They are, in Europe, they are, uh, all the countries are. Um, there are so many barriers to an entrepreneur. It's outrageous. It's, it's amazing that they've been able to survive as long as they have, that they have economies doing as well as they are. Um, things are much better here than anywhere in, in, in Europe by far, maybe anywhere in, in the world. So maybe I, we don't have, uh, we shouldn't be complaining so much. So do you think that could be a reason also why we're dropping our standards? Because we keep comparing ourselves to other countries that we're doing better of. So at least we're doing better than X, Y, Z. No, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, mostly you hear a lot of whining. Uh, here from, or other countries? Here. Here, okay, got it. Um, I'm not a big believer in whining. I'm a believer in looking at what's good, what's there, uh, the potential, um, and stop complaining and woe is me. Uh, among the intelligentsia here, there's definitely a sense of what the Carter word of malaise, uh, we're on the decline, uh, etc. woe is me. I, I don't like to think like that. I, I think that um, there's tremendous energy, and maybe it's coming from a lot of the immigrants that are coming to the United States. So, um, I don't know, 20 years things could be bleak, but I, I am, part of me is very hopeful. So the immigrants are bringing hope to the country. Well, they always have. Yeah, of course. They of always course. have. So, I, so the entitlement mindset, can that really, if we're going to the entitlement mentality, hypothetically, you know, we, if we can't, if we are going to that direction, or maybe there's a, you know, sprinkle of that going on a little bit, you know, I feel bad for me, you know, all that stuff. How do you shift that entitlement mentality based on what you've studied, what you've seen with different, uh, uh, you know, countries? How do you shift that mindset outside of leaving the entitlement mentality? It's a, you know, oh man. Um, That's pretty tough to do. I mean, <laughs> I, I can yeah. see it being a lot easier to go from, it's almost like imagine if you and I are brothers, okay, hypothetically, and we're stepbrothers now. You come from another marriage. Your father was extremely disciplinarian, okay? Mm -hmm. And your mother, she loved you, but she, your father was an extremely disciplinarian, hypothetically. And your father marries my mother, okay? So my mother and your mother are very similar, but my father was not a disciplinarian, yeah. okay? So now I'm going from a father that never disciplined me. He didn't make me do anything. And now your father comes in and says, Patrick, get your act together. Yeah. I'm like, who are you to tell me what to do? My dad wasn't like that. Yeah. And you're used to it. So how do we get me to get accustomed to the mindset that your father taught you? I think that's something that we see the entire mindset. Well, it's once again the belief, a fundamental belief. I keep coming down to, back to that. And we discussed a little bit at lunch mm -hmm. where... Uh, the crash of 08 played a bit of a role. If, if you believe that people get ahead in America by kind of cheating, by playing with the rules, um, you know, the way the banks were, et cetera, uh, that that's how you get ahead in America. It's all about elites. If you're in on Wall Street, you can make millions of dollars, it's, and the little man is kind of kept out of it. If you believe that that's what it's all about, um, then you're not you're going to have that inevitably that entitlement mentality, and um, nothing is going to drum it out of you. Um, so it's the connections that you the individual makes in their mind. Do they see people out there who let's say I'm somebody that didn't have a good education mm -hmm. and didn't have an opportunity to go to a great school. Mm -hmm. I come from an inner city uh, or wherever. Um, do I see examples of people out there who have been able to get ahead on their own through their own initiative, their mm -hmm. own drive, create a great business, their role, their role players and models in my community, uh, they're not having to do with rap or entertainment, but they're business solid things mm -hmm. that employing a lot of mm -hmm. people. I believe that, that, that there's a connection between your effort and achievement. 
If you see enough people out there in your family, in your community, then you begin to believe that you yourself can do it. And there'll be a tipping point. Such a where, good point. There'll be a tipping point where there's enough of that going on mm -hmm. where a culture starts developing from the inside. Yeah. You know? do we, now, do we need media's help with that? So where media, instead of If you of need media's the help, you're already too far gone. If you need media's help. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So you're saying this is possible without the need of media? Since we they live the... in a culture where people are so saturated with internet, media, etc. Mm -hmm. that it, it just goes through one ear out the other. So you don't think media has any influence? It might. Really? It Robert. might. It does, but it's it's minor compared to something that comes from deeper. Wow, okay, that's interesting. Well, why don't we transition? You talk about education. So after high school, Robert Greene, yeah. the author of 40 Laws of Power, goes to college. You go to Berkeley and then you went to the University of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And then you come out, and I read that you had some 80 different jobs. Right. You had 80 different jobs before the book came about. Yeah. So when you, when you talk to your partner and you guys decided to write the 40 Laws of Power, why 48 laws? Why not 50 laws? Why not 25 laws? How did you come up with the number 48 laws? Well, basically what happened was I had been writing uh, from all my whole life, mm -hmm. but I'd never written a book. And I was about 35 years old, and I was in Italy for a job. And I met this man, Joost Elfers, mm -hmm. who's a book packager. Mm -hmm. And he asked me if I had any ideas for a book. And all of my experience working in the work world with particularly in Hollywood, uh, a lot of bad, seen a lot of power games, and I read a lot of Machiavelli, and so I just sort of improvised this idea. He got very excited, and he said, look, you write a treatment, and if I like it, I'll pay you to live for a year to write the book, and I'll get it sold. And as I'm doing the research for it, um, and I'm reading Machiavelli, I'm reading history, I'm just going, I'm like a fiend, I'm so excited, this book's gonna change my <laughs> life. Uh, you know, I'm, I come up, there are these, ah, there are these patterns in history. I, don't, I haven't called them laws yet, they're these patterns. If you do better than your superior, if he gets, or she gets insecure about you, you're in trouble. Oh, I've seen that in China, in Renaissance Italy, mm -hmm. in modern America. Ah, never outshine the master. Mm -hmm. And I'm slowly creating more of these, and I end up with like 72. And I say, I tell Joost, the partner, I've got these sort of these laws and stuff. He says, ah, Robert, he's, he's Dutch. That's your book, The Laws of Power. Oh, okay, yeah, you're right, that's a good idea. And it's to me, it's like cooking. You take a sauce and you put it on the burner, and the more you cook, the, the, the less and less it gets. So there's a point where it's really strong and tastes, tastes wonderful. You can't cook it too much, but you have to cook it just right. Well, I had those 72 laws and there were too many. And as the sauce gets better and I'm learning more, that's out, that's out, that's out, that's out, down to 48. Wow. And that was like the heart of it. That's the really good sauce. That's, they're no more and they're no less, 48. You know what would be so interesting? I would be, I bet everybody would be so curious to know the 24 laws that didn't make the cutoff. <laughs> I would be so curious. If you, if you wrote something and said the 24 that didn't make the cutoff. Well, it's I, not that I would, they didn't make the cutoff. Were they uh, combined with they another were combined, one? Okay. Nothing that is missing. Sense. So, yeah. for instance, I know, I remember one, which is um, about uh, don't make promises. Uh, it's a Napoleonic idea. A lot of kings have this idea. Because if you make too many promises, you're going to be held to them. Mm -hmm. So a king, a ruler, should never make too many promises. Um, be very sparing with them. And I was going to have a law like that. And I got, God, this isn't a law. It's not, a, it's not weighty enough. But I can put it into say less than necessary. You know, I can put it in other laws. That's what happened. Got it. So it got filtered down from 72. Some of them got combined together. By the way, that question was asked... Because I, I, I asked the question on Twitter, and we had Manoj Awasti from Norton, India, Uttar Pradesh, who asked the question, why 40 laws? But I asked the question, some guy from India, okay? Jerry Titus, he came out and he said, look, this, this book, you know, this book is not a book that people need to read. It's purely manipulative, and it's what our politicians, you know, there's some critic, a lot of criticism about this book as well. All our politicians subscribe to this book, and... 
he wrote a book that's so disgusting and it's so many deceptions to it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he said, he asked one question. He said, is half truth a whole lie? I said, let me ask Robert a question to see what he's gonna, how he's gonna ask, answer that question for you. I don't know what that means. You know, like uh, I do a lot of consulting, etc. And people ask questions and I say, well, what do you really mean? If I had Jerry here, get specific, my friend. Tell me what that is. What, what in real life is that about? You know, do you know what that, what he's asking? So Jerry, why don't you ask that question? I'll send it to him and maybe he'll respond back to you <laughs> but, uh, on that. But no, I, I get what you're saying. I guess, you know, when, when he was going into it, he is, 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 think about it this way. Here's what it is. I mean, this was my response back to him. My response back well, was... Well, just explain to me his question. Yeah, he's asking a question that, you know, uh, uh, a politician gets up on stage and he says, you know, uh, such and such health care program is not going to cost you a single penny. It's going to be free. And we find out a year later that it does. So it was a half-truth. Is that a lie? Is that okay to do, to gain the power? Uh, uh, these, these are questions that drive me crazy. Of course it's not okay. If we lived in an ideal society, yeah. if this were a utopia, yes, that would be terrible. But we don't live in a utopia. We're totally humans. Agree. We're we're descended from primates. I can And agree people with you lie. More. And politicians tell us the problem. Politicians lie. I don't know. Politicians they lie. The problem is with people who believe that we should be something oh, that we're not. You. That was my answer back. Um, so it, people are too naive. Obviously, when your politician says that, you should be saying, "Well, I know what he's playing. I know what game he's playing. He's playing a law of power right yes. there." Yes. Yes. You know. Yes. Um, so. Half the book I wrote to make people less naive about mm -hmm. power. Mm -hmm. But I mean, getting to the question of, I don't know if this is a question, uh, is the book evil? Uh, okay, so I, here, here would be my response. First of all, humans by our nature, we want power. The feeling that you have no control, it's just that we define the word power in the wrong way. We think of power as some sort of dark force out there among negative not yeah. a positive thing oh but it's always the other person yes yeah. it's, it's we never have power it's always the other guy that has the power and yes. controls me yeah no i'm talking about it's you as an individual yep when you're growing up in your family when you've got siblings and a parent you want more attention you want mm -hmm. mother and father to look mm -hmm. at you you want the teacher to recognize you um you want to be able to have influence over your parents and over your friends. You want power. You want a degree of control. Mm -hmm. The feeling that you have from a very early age that you have no power warps you, makes you neurotic, drives you absolutely crazy. You want the feeling that you have control over your destiny, over your circumstances. That's the formula, that's the definition that I give of power. The other thing is, we humans have a, we actually love power. We We're, love power. We do. We, we are seduced by it. That's why shows like The House of Cards, which show all that ugly, dark yeah. stuff, is so popular. We love hearing about it. We love the things that go on. Mm -hmm. But just physically, if we go to a place of power, let's say a big Hollywood studio, if I transported you out there to the offices of HBO or some amazing office, mm -hmm. you'd be like, whoa, and you'd be excited and you want to learn. Right. Whereas right. we are fascinated by it. It's just we don't want to admit it. The book is an expose of what happens in every single human environment. You put three people together and they're power games. Maybe two, I don't know, maybe not two, but three. Three people together, there's, there are power games. Yes, okay, no matter what. So these are the power games that are played in Hollywood, in business, in politics, in the arts, in sports, etc. You may not like them. I'm not saying uh, that you're gonna like selective honesty where I talk about how people use fake sincerity to get their way but you're going to want to know about it because people use it all the time mm -hmm. these are the laws that are got, that happen behind closed doors in all of these different arenas if you're an adult you'll be able to know how to handle that knowledge in a good way yeah my response back to him was is when you say all these politicians who get up there and want to say whatever they want to say to gain our vote and those guys subscribe to this book. Don't you think you need to read the book so you know their strategies on what's well, happening? First of all, let's correct a misconception. These people that you're talking about, politicians in India or whomever, or a person like Berlusconi or whomever, mm -hmm. they don't need the 48 Laws of Power. They don't need to read it. It's in their DNA. If they have to read a book, they're already it's already too late. Yeah, yeah. These the sharks in the world, the people who are really sharky. Um, you know, like the 
Eisner, you know, Walt Disney, those cut those types are Ovitz. These people don't need a book. The book might help them a little bit. They might like reading Sun Tzu, et cetera, but it's in there. They don't need a book. You, Jerry, out there in India, you're the one that needs to read the book, not them. They don't even, 48 lost powers. I, I, I gonna... think this is a very important book for middle America to read. Mm. I think it's a very important book. Look, right now we're sitting here, we're talking about it. There's a couple of people that want, you know, there's thousands of people that are going to watch this video on YouTube. Okay, great. But I think for us, modern time, you know, I have some books back here that, you, you know, you were kind of going through, you know, whether it's uh, The Prince, right? Or we have Seneca, you know, you and I both mm -hmm. subscribe to some Stoicism or Meditations or mm -hmm. Analects or 40 Laws of, you know, or, or, or History from Will Durant or Art of War. I think, and this is my honest opinion, I think... A thousand years from now, people are going to be still reading 40 Laws of Power. That's my opinion. Obviously, you're the author. I wish I could be around for I, that. I, I, don't I think this book is going to have effects yeah, for thousands of years. I think it's a timeless, evergreen book that will be forever used. And I recommend everybody to read it. Oh, thank you. Um, so here, here's one other question we'll do. And then I'll go to some specific questions I have for you that sure. are from the book. Uh, Ken Cerna from Dallas, Texas asked, it's a pretty good question here. Who's the one person you're fascinated with? fascinated with the most, like leaders you've studied? Who fascinated you the most? Mm. You know, it's, it's interesting because each book that I write, they generally is like a main figure or a couple of main mm -hmm. figures. And I, I have to like the people that I write about. I want to, like, they're almost like my friends. So each book, it changes. Like for power, I got into Talleyrand a lot. I mean, he really... Of course, Machiavelli himself, but Talleyrand, who was one of the main characters. Interesting. Because he was so devious um, that's so brilliant and if you think about it here's a man if you read the 48 laws of power you'll get a lot of this who came from the aristocracy in 18th century france lives survives the french revolution survives the napoleonic era survives the aftermath of the napoleon mm -hmm. the restoration mm -hmm. and in each of all of these extremely radical turns of events he lands on top that's a pretty pretty amazing story but then each book's different, you know, for seduction, a uh, character like Ca Casanova uh, uh, fascinates That's me, or, er or Errol Flynn, these great seducers. So that changes. Na war was Napoleon. Uh, I'm endlessly fascinated by Napoleon because I call him the Mozart of warfare, of strategy. He had a feel for it. He had a brain for warfare. And I wanted to figure out why. Because I, I read a lot of books about Napoleon, they don't really explain why. Why Napoleon? Why was he so much better than anybody in history? Those 10 years, 1796 to 1806, you will never read in the history of, our, of, of anywhere in, 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 in all cultures a more remarkable period of 10 years of strategic brilliance than what Napoleon did there. Why? So he fascinated me. And in my new book, I have other people now that I find like our, our new icons that kind of fascinate me. I got into Lyndon Johnson because he's an absolute master. Were you talk about Lyndon game. Johnson in, in 33 I Strategies do, as well? I do. I'm going even him deeper running. into him. Really? In, in the new book. For Mastery uh, Da Vinci. So I like to, f whatever the subject is, I, 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 I tend to fall in love with who I need to fall in love with. So it's a lot of falling in love. Is yeah. there one specific <laughs> falling in love with <laughs> no. books? What, what, what are some of your favorite books that inspired you? I know you were, we were talking a little bit about books. Could you put one or two or three together? Well, obviously Machiavelli. And it's not just The Prince. Uh, the Discourses of Machiavelli is one of the, my favorite books. I liked all of his, his works. Um, it's kind of a spirit uh, that very few writers have, Machiavelli. It's so honest. It's just so honest about humans and what drives us. And it's such well-written and so direct. And I, I just love reading him. I love Thucydides um, in the history of the Peloponnesian War. Sun Tzu is a favorite. I love Musashi. Um, I'm heavily into Zen Buddhism and, and samurai warfare. So a lot of you know people like Musashi, obviously fascinate me. Um, those are just some of them. Very I, I mean, I read over 
two, three hundred books to write one book, so you're asking me to choose among thousands. You have to read two to three hundred books to write one book. Yes. That's a good number to know. Two to three hundred books to write one book. Yes. Wow. You were telling me you got eight more to go before you wrap up a, oh, my next this book. new exciting project yes. that maybe you'll give us a glimpse of it at the end of later sure, so sure, we know sure, what it's about. So, so let me get into some specifics, questions that I have. And I'd like to actually take the books because I marked them out in, in areas that I want to ask you. So in, in 48 Laws, law number 10, infection, avoid the unhappy and the unlucky. Yeah. Okay. In the judgment, you say you can die from someone else's misery. Emotional states are infectious as diseases. You may feel you are helping the drowning man, but you are only precipitating your own disaster. The unfortunate sometimes draw misfortune on themselves. They will also draw it onto you. Associate with the happy and the fortunate instead. Why do you think it's so hard for us to constantly find ourselves trying to solve the problems of a person who they don't really want to solve that problem. Why do you think that's a... Well, the, you know, there's a, I talk a lot about it in that chapter. Mm -hmm. So I call them infecting types. There are people that are naturally going to infect you with their drama, with their bullshit, mm -hmm. with their, you know, just all the stuff that's going on sure. in their life. And um, I have in there the example of Lola Montez, this... In, very beautiful woman who seduced uh, King of Bavaria and literally destroyed him single-handedly. And the reason that these types, you're drawn to them, is they're very dramatic. They're very charismatic. They have a lot of problems, but they make give you the impression that they're a victim. You know, oh, I've had such an unfortunate life. This, this man was terrible to me. My parents were awful, blah, blah, blah. They have a lot of energy, a lot of drive, they're very charismatic, and like a, a whirlpool, like quicksand, they draw you into their life and they, you just go down with them because you're not aware of the fact that really it isn't other people to blame, it's themselves. That's right. They, at their core, have an emptiness, um, they have great needs that can never be met. There's something wrong deep down inside, yeah. and in a chapter I say, it's not worth trying to figure out why Lola Montez is the way she is, just get away from them. The only solution when you have an infecting, someone who's infectious, quarantine. Get away from them. <laughs> Go far away. Don't get involved. Now, people misunderstand that law. They think, well, what about people who are unfortunate, who really have yes. been? No, that's yes. not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about people who are the victims of injustice, who do deserve our sympathy and our empathy. I'm talking about those other types, and everybody has known them in their life, where you call them drama queens, whatever you want, they make you believe that they're a victim, and in fact they're not, and they bring you down. And the opposite side of it is, we're social animals, and we draw the energy from other people in ways that are pre-verbal. Everyone has the experience where when you're with one person, they make you feel a certain way, and with another person, you suddenly act completely differently, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. we, ha we, we're, we have that animal mm -hmm. thing going on where we're in. And if you are surrounded by someone who's positive, who has a good attitude, who believes in what we're talking about, that you can control your destiny, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it infects you. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of people you want to be around. And you know, that goes right into it. It's so interesting. You say that in this book, and then in 33 law, uh, Strategies of War, uh, you talk about it in strategy number five, avoid the snares of groupthink, okay? And this one part, it says, when a failure life failure like this happens, you're referencing a story be, uh, before it on what happened with Hamilton. When a, a failure like this happens, when a golden opportunity slips through your fingers, you naturally look for a cause, right? Maybe you blame your incompetent officers, your faulty technology, your flawed intelligence, but that is to look at the world backward. It ensures more failure. The truth is that everything starts from the top. So do you think when someone's going through that part where, you know, feel bad for me for what I'm going through, they actually have an opportunity there to take that as a source if they take responsibility and fix certain areas to do something big with their lives and they took a different route? Do you think that's what happens at that point? For who? For the... 
for the person that is actually just went through a trial or a tribulation that took place to them, and they see, want to blame everybody. Instead, they said, let me see how I could have improved this situation, well, grow from it, and go to the next that's level. A, that's an excellent observation, and you're probably true. That probably is the seed for it. But humans naturally project, uh, look outward when there's a problem. And I explain in my new book why I think that is, the, the science behind it. Um, when something goes wrong, our first instinct is to look out, mm. word. Mm -hmm. That person did this to me, blah, 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 blah. It happens to me, it happens to everyone. The difference is, do you catch yourself in the moment of blaming other people and stop and say, well, wait a minute, maybe that's not the case. Maybe they're 50% to blame, but maybe I'm 30%. And that 30% of what you did is the most important thing, not their 50%. You have no control over no that. Control over but that. you control what you did. Yeah. And inevitably, you are never the victim of something. Inevitably, oh, well, I shouldn't say never. That there are people who are victims. But most often, there is something that you did that has a contributing factor to what happened. And if there's ever a disaster or a mistake or your book doesn't sell well, Let's say I write a book, let's say The 48 Laws of Power, I write it in 96, and it comes out in 98, and it bombs. And I'm not here talking to you. Mm. I didn't write it the way I wrote it. Am I going to blame all the millions of people out there who couldn't appreciate my brilliance? No. I, somehow I didn't write it in a way mm -hmm. that connected with people. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thinking that you want to go through, and I think you're right. Most people do the opposite. Such a good point. These books are so powerful. Here's another one you have here that just, I mean, I love. It says, an oak tree, let me say where it's at, Law 22, which is use the surrender tactic, transform weakness into power. You say the oak tree, the oak tree, that the oak that resists the wind loses its branches one by one. And with nothing left to protect it, the trunk finally snaps. The oak that bends lives longer its trunk growing wider, its roots deeper and more tenacious. Why is it so hard for us sometimes to dance with the winds that we have in our lives? Because we all have it. Yeah. Well, um, you know, you have to go through accepting a lot of things. Um, there are circumstances um, that you can't control. Mm -hmm. um, if you're in business, there's a lot mm -hmm. that you can't control. If you write a book, you have no control over how people read it and what kind of success you're going to have. You have no control over the economy at large, over global factors in your industry. If you go crazy trying to think of how, you, you know, getting all emotional about all of these things, you're going to lose your hair, you're going to get cancer, and you're going to die. You have to learn how to accept the things. But more than that, um, you have to learn, and this is something actually that my former, my protege, Ryan Holiday, talks very well in his book Obstacles that I recommend reading, The Obstacle is the Way. Oftentimes, failure, mistakes, problems are actually the best thing that can happen to you. Uh, and that's sort of more like what we're talking about with that oak tree there. That instead of getting reactive and going, God damn it, why did I, you know, what's wrong there? And getting all stiff and rigid. Mm -hmm. Just bend with it and say... This happened for a reason. It's teaching me a lesson. Um, I made a mistake. I need to learn uh, from this. Um, I've had this happen to me. Uh, when I was writing Mastery, um, I was written four of the six chapters, but I was really late in delivering it to my publisher. And they came to me and they said, Robert, if you don't finish Mastery in two months, we're canceling the project. I'm like, oh my God, I've been working on this for three years. I put my blood and everything I've got into it. I can't, but I can't finish it in two months. It's the two most important chapters. It's all this complicated research, wow. forget it. Then I calmed down after two days of hyperventilating. And I said, I have no choice. I got to bend with this. I got to do it. And it ended up being the best thing that could happen to me. Because those two months were the greatest two months of my life. I worked so hard um, and ideas were coming to me in my sleep as I'm showering I just had built up so much momentum so those the bending with the problems like that ends up being the best thing that mm. you can do powerful and and that was one of our favorite books we read last year and we read Ryan Holiday was a couple months ago this year when we read it we this was the book everybody was in love with this one 
it's great to know what you do with your protege there. Okay, next question here. And this is my favorite chapter of 33 Strategies of War, Chapter 4. I mean, I can't get it. Obviously, that's Napoleon. You know that whole part. Death ground. Oh, death ground. It's, it's, it's unreal. It says, create a sense of urgency and desperation, the death ground strategy, right? And I'll read the bottom part of it. Cut your ties to the past. Enter unknown territory where you must depend on your wits and energy to see you through. Place yourself on death ground where your back is against the wall and you have to fight like hell to get out alive. You know when I read this, you know what concerns me sometimes? It amazes me how many people are okay living their lives without ever knowing the unknown capacity that they have. What could you say about that chapter right there? Well, it's, it is one of the, it's a really, you know, I love that chapter too. Um, and it's, it's um, something that comes from Sun Tzu. Um, he has the expression about put your army on death ground. Mm -hmm. And it'll fight like you'll never have an army fight like that, meaning that if an army's back is to the wall, there's a, they're on the ocean, they're fighting on a beach, and there's a mountain behind them. Mm -hmm. They either beat the enemy or they die. That's right. There's nowhere to retreat, and they're gonna they're gonna win. Um, is has real primal importance for us because when our energy, our level of energy, determines what happens to us, if we're excited by something, if we have to get out, if we have to make something succeed, we will put in 10 times the amount of energy than if we don't have that feeling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So sometimes you have to artificially put yourself in death. Isn't that not amazing? You have to say, so let's say you've, I've got an idea for a business. I'm 24 years old. I think it's going to be brilliant. It's going to be a startup. It's going to shake the universe. But I don't think I've got the money. My parents don't want to give me the $20,000, and I don't have enough experience. I better go get a job working for Goldman Sachs for a couple of years. That energy level is going, ooh, mm -hmm, ooh, mm -hmm. when you're now you're 28, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Okay, now but you're 24 and you say, no, I don't have the money, I don't have the experience, but I'm going to make, I'm going to try. Mm -hmm. So you go ahead and you try, you somehow raise the money, you find an angel. You Now you better succeed or you've lost this person all mm -hmm. their money, you're going to try like hell and you're going to put in so much more energy and you're going to make it happen. And if you fail, which can happen, you've learned something so valuable. You've learned more in two years of failure than 20 years of business school, you know, and you're going to make your next thing a success. So the amount of energy you put into something determines the result. And if you don't feel the necessity to make it work, you're going to put in much less That's than right. is necessary. So put yourself on death ground. I love it. And the last one I'll ask you here is this. Um, strategy number 17, which is defeat them in detail, the divide and conquer strategy. I mean, obviously, that's the major art of war, Sun Tzu. He always talks about the divide and conquer. You talk about Samuel Adams here, right? And it's, I'm just going to read one sentence of it. It says, Samuel Adams, okay, who was... Part of the whole, you know, American colony, he believed that should one day win complete independence from England, establish a government based on the writings of the English philosopher John Locke. We've heard about that. Okay. He had that obsessive glint in the eye that makes people think you're a crackpot, right? And, you know, you know I was telling you about the, the couple of the books here where I said, you know, the first rate madness and same guy that wrote the book about, you know, Clinton, the hypomanic yeah. edge where he's talking about. The, the comparisons between bipolar and mm -hmm. hypomanic and mania and mm -hmm. depressive and Lincoln was a little bit bipolar, oh, all these different okay. things. Do you think, you know, when we when we sit there and we, we get these uh, schools or these doctors, oh, that kid's got ADD, that kid's got this, you got an illness, you got this, you got hypomanic, you got bipolar, you have mental problems is what you have. And we need to guard this person. They are maybe strangling the next Einstein, the next Abraham Lincoln, do you think there is a correlation between the obsessive craziness that people think that guy's a nutcase with someone doing something big? Do you think there is some kind of a correlation there? Definitely. Um, you know, uh, I mean, I could go on for four hours on this subject. Um, <laughs> when I talk about, in mastery, about what we said earlier about your primal inclinations, mm -hmm. What I'm saying is it, it's the ultimate individualist philosophy because they're saying there's something in you when you're born that you were meant to achieve. 
you were meant to start a business that reflects something about who you are, mm -hmm. or write a book, or do something in politics, or whatever. And if you cultivate that, you're going to end up creating something that's peculiar to you and inevitably has a touch of weirdness about it. Because if you're so much an individual, you're not like anybody else. You are literally idiosyncratic. And that has an edge of madness or whatever you want. But all of the great achievers, if you go back, had moments early on in their life where people thought that this guy is a nutcase. Mm -hmm. I mean, a classic case would be Steve Jobs. Um, He's a total obs manic, obsessive person um, to the point where he, he was mentally ill. And people thought that. And they got rid of him out of Apple because they couldn't stand That's the right. guy. He was like toxic, a nightmare. Okay, now if he never came back to Apple, we would never be talking about Steve Jobs. He would have been a failure or maybe not a complete failure, but nothing like what he is now. Um, so all of these people have that touch because they end up... They know that there's something inside of themselves that's different. They're going to cultivate it and they're going to create a business or they're going to make a discovery that's unique to them. And that is pure brilliance. And if in our school system, I think a lot of uh, problems are with boys more than girls these days. Because I know myself and a lot of boys, when you're really young, you've got a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. You're restless. Mm -hmm. You can't really, you're eight years old, you want to be out there playing or doing something. You want to sit there and read. And they're sitting there looking at teachers are looking at little boys and they're going, man, I can't handle this kid. Let's put him on a drug. Let's drug him into, into, into you know, being obedient or whatever. Um, I don't want to generalize so much, but I know it's more of a problem with a lot of boys. Mm -hmm. Whereas, in fact, in my generation, they would, you just would have gone out in the playground and got all your energy out. Um, we've got to learn to, like, respect people's differences and understand that not everyone is a student. I make the point in Mastery... A mastery isn't about writing a book or being an intellectual. If you work with your hands, or you're Michael Jordan, you're a master. Uh, you're an architect, or you're the guy who helped build, the, redo the patio on my house. He was a master. It's not about an intellectual thing. Working with our hands is very powerful. Whatever it is that you do, you need to cultivate it and understand what makes you different that's inevitably sure. going to make you a weirdo. And let's celebrate it. Let's celebrate weirdness. Yeah. I like that slogan. Let's celebrate. <laughs> that should be the next presidential campaign. Well, Let's Apple celebrate. Had, Apple had a slogan Let's be like different. That. Be different. Yeah, yeah be which different isn't quite the same thing. No, and I had a chance to interview Steve Wozniak. Oh. Uh, and this was in 2010, before Steve Jobs had passed away. Oh. And it was fascinating. Really? Robert. Oh, Mike. The stuff he was telling me, and we, we, we surprised him with the computer. It's on YouTube as well, Steve Wozniak interview. And we brought him the computer, and you should have seen the look on his head. Oh, we made that, and back in 19, you know, he was telling you, all You the, had the actual... We actually had the computer. You somebody, bought one? Yeah, we had it. One of our friends from D.C. brought it. Oh. And we had him sign it, and we took it back oh, to D.C. It was real unique, real oh. unique experience with him. Um, so, so here's the last thing. So I know you were telling me that you're working on a project. And look, there are very, very few authors that if they come out with a book, I'm reading that book. It doesn't matter who it is, what book it is. And same goes with Hollywood, with acting certain move. When you come out with a book, I'm reading that book. I was upset when I couldn't get mastery early on because you had the whole pre-sale going on. So I want that book today, right? I was waiting for that book. But right. I'll get you an advanced copy of the new one. I appreciate that. I love it. Um, so tell us a little bit about this project you're working on that, you know, we're all waiting to read. Well, um, it's called the law, temper, it's provisional title is The Laws of Human Nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And basically, it's an expansion of Chapter 4 in Mastery on Social Intelligence. Okay. And the idea is that uh, we're social animals. We're the, by far, uh, the most brilliant social animal that ever existed. It's the source of our power. We're uh, able to understand each other on a level that no other animal can communicate on. Um, and our success in life depends on our ability to get along with other people mm -hmm. and also defend ourselves from other people that are trying to harm us in whatever way or compete against us. So our ability to navigate that environment is going to separate us from failure and success. And we are mostly operate, operating blindly. We don't know what's going on in the, in the minds of other people. We're guessing. And a lot of our guessing is comes from ourselves, our narcissism, mm -hmm. our egotism, mm -hmm. we, we project onto them our own emotions. 
And because of that, we're constantly misreading, misunderstandings, problems, failure, disaster. But we're born with an amazing capacity to understand people if we learn to develop it through empathy, through a great deal of knowledge, through understanding these timeless laws of what makes human beings tick. I'm going to try and give you these 24 right now, elemental laws. You're going to understand the human animal on a much higher level, why people are envious, why people uh, are so irrational, why people are prone to conformity oh, and, and groupthink, um, why some people are aggressive and some people are passive aggressive. I'm going to give you the sort of textbook on human nature. And so now when you're in an interaction, you're going to look and understand people differently. You're going to take a step back and go, ah, he's presenting me a mask that makes me feel this mm -hmm. way, but I know probably there's something else going on behind him. And I have a better idea now because I've got this knowledge. That's in a nutshell what I'm hoping to do here. With What's the, the timeline on this, Robert? <laughs> What's the timeline on <laughs> well, this? You're teasing us. <laughs> probably, uh, if everything comes well, you know, uh, like a year and a half, It'll be out okay. at the most two years, but hopefully a year and a half. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to it myself. And yeah, you told me something I didn't know about you. I had no idea you were a Lakers fan. I am the greatest Lakers fan that ever You're, You can't say that. You don't know how big of a fan I am. I go back further than you. I, went to I was Laker. in the Middle East when you were watching the Lakers. I went to a Lakers game in 1963 you got with me my beat. father uh, when I was beat. four years old at the... At the uh, Los Angeles Sports Arena. Which Who was 63? Jerry West? Who was Elgin Baylor was before Jerry West. Got it. 63. Elgin, Elgin Baylor. 63 point Walt game. Walt Hazard might have been on the team, but Elgin Baylor is the only person I can remember. Wow. Their uniforms were blue. They didn't look like anything. Uh, I bleed purple and gold, man. I love the Lakers. And when they had their run with Shaq, which was, you know, the heyday, those the, yeah. uh, those three years. Is that your favorite team, by the way? Would you say I love the Magic, the Showtime. Got it. But I love, those two are my favorite, obviously. Um, I couldn't even watch the games. I was so nervous. You know, I had to have like a couple of drinks. <laughs> I was, I just can't, I'm so neurotic when they play. I mean, now it's not the same because they kind of suck. But I was so, oh my God, I can't even watch this. It's making me want to die. Most painful game was game seven against the Celtics a couple years ago. Oh, I couldn't even watch that. I mean, that was a Kobe's having a terrible game I and Artes is coming back and Rondo. But, and I mean, you were maybe seven years old. I don't know if you... You weren't even here yet. I was in Iran, you know, no, throwing the rocks showtime around. Year, we were when we, playing when we soccer, lost man. against the Celtics back then, that yeah, was... I wasn't here. Or Don Nelson's shot in 71 that, that he made a last-second shot that bounced off the rim. like the, the only Don Nelson I know is the coach. I don't remember Don Nelson playing. He was a Laker killer. He just he built, he single-handedly beat the Lakers. Laker killer, huh? What a nickname to give to somebody. So who's your favorite Laker of all time? Is it Magic or Kobe? You know, I recently had lunch with Kareem. That was pretty awesome because uh, I grew up a Kareem he's idol. A, he's a pretty interesting guy, by the way. Very he's interesting. a very intellectual, uh, deep thinker. He is. He's a very interesting guy. Um, uh, Magic, I think, is the greatest player I've ever seen play. I love Kobe. I love Kobe for who he is and for Magic his work. Magic is the greatest player you've ever seen oh. play? You have, well, I was seeing him on the court, the name Magic is real. The guy could do things that you just can't believe. He's six nine, and he's acting like he's six feet tall. He's like a point guard at six nine, and he makes these passes, and he's just like a, gen a field general, and he's so creative. I don't think, and I've seen Michael Jordan, etc. Uh, Magic's the greatest player I've ever seen. Are you kidding me? Yeah. No, I'm not kidding you. <laughs> you're kidding me. Okay, so you're a real deal Laker fan. So. You know, it, uh, hopefully if Westbrook comes here next year, okay, and we get Westbrook and maybe we get Durant or somebody, Durant's probably going to go to Washington, but they may get Westbrook because he played here. Yeah, if they put a good team together, maybe we'll go watch a courtside game oh. together, you and I. That'd be kind of fun for <laughs> us to do. So, sure. Sure. so yeah, anyways, uh, this, this, has been, this has been one of the coolest interviews well, I've done. I've been looking forward to this for 12 years. When I read the book first time, I said, I want to meet this guy. Yeah. And I want to speak to this guy. And it's been a pleasure having you here. Hope I didn't disappoint. No, no, the lunch. I, I wish the lunch, we could have had a longer lunch because yeah. that was getting pretty intense yeah. and exciting what we were talking about. But, uh, you know, if, if you're watching this uh, uh, right now, uh, and uh, I could tell you a couple things. If you haven't read any of his books, if you haven't read any of Robert's books ever, I recommend you picking up every single 
one of the books. We have the link on the bottom in the description and reading it. And also at the same time, you know, Robert's got a website as well. It's called Power Seduction and War.com. Power Seduction and War. Dot com. The end is spelled out. You'll see and A N D. The link is on the video as well as you can see. And that link will be on the description description as well. Go to that website, subscribe to his newsletters, uh, track what he's doing as well. And obviously his book, the moment it comes out, we're probably going to be doing something here together as well, having him back to do a, a show. That'd be great if you That'll come back fun. to do That'll something with that video. But uh, it's been a pleasure having you here with us. If you haven't subscribed to our channel, subscribe to the channel as well. But Robert, thank you so much for thank coming you. out. We had thank a great you, time Patrick. here today. I thank really you for your time. It. Oh, my pleasure. Absolutely.